七十年前的今天，毛泽东同志在这里向世界庄严宣告了中华人民共和国的成立。中国人民从此站起来了。这一伟大事件彻底改变了近代以后一百多年。中国积贫积弱、受人欺凌的悲惨命运，中华民族走上了实现伟大复兴的壮阔道路。On April 30th, 1948, the Central Committee of the CPC issued May 1 slogans to mark International Labor Day, in which it called on non-communist parties, civil organizations and community leaders to quickly convene a political consultative conference to discuss and realize the convening of the People's Congress and the establishment of a democratic coalition government. The May 1 slogans were greeted with a strong response from all walks of life. At that time, a large number of patriotic democratic activists gathered in Hong Kong under the direct leadership of the Central Committee of the CPC, Pan Han Yen and Chen Zhe Guang secretly sent many of them to the liberated areas in chartered foreign ships under the cover of transporting goods. In this way, over 350 democratic activists arrived in liberated areas in seven groups, from September 1948 to March 1949. Their feelings were beyond words when they finally arrived. 74-year-old Shun Jun Ru was thrown high in the air again and again by those who had finally reunited with their fellow countrymen. In September 1948, meanwhile, the Political Bureau of the Central Committee held an enlarged meeting to discuss the state and government systems of the new China that was soon to be founded. Mao Zedong was particular in emphasizing, since we have the state system of the People's Democratic Dictatorship, Titles of governments at all levels as well as departments of state power must contain the word people. March 1949, it's been almost one year since the Central Committee's move to the village of Shibaipo in Hebei province. From here, it had commanded and won the three major campaigns of Liaoning Shenyang, Huaihai and Beiping Tianjin, with the last one achieving the peaceful liberation of Beiping in January. The 7th Central Committee of the CPC held its second plenary session on March the 5th in Shibaipo village. The session discussed the center of gravity of the party's work should be shifted from the village to the city, defined the basic political, economic and foreign policies the party should adopt after victory, and set the general tasks and main course for transforming China from an agricultural into an industrial country, from a new democratic into a socialist society. Mao Zedong pointed out, to win countrywide victory is only the first step in a long march. He also gave a timely warning that the comrades must be taught to remain modest, prudent and free from arrogance and rashness in their style of work. The comrades must be taught to preserve the style of plain living and hard struggle. On March 23rd, the party leadership led by Mao Zedong moved to Beiping from Shibaipo its last command center in the rural area. Before leaving, Mao Zedong quipped to Zhou Enlai that it was time for the CPC to take its imperial exam in the ancient imperial capital. Zhou Enlai replied, we should all be able to pass the exam. We won't go back to where we were. Mao Zedong said, going back would be equivalent to defeat. We will never be like Li Zicheng. 
Let's hope we pass the exam with flying colours. On the afternoon of March the 25th, Mao Zedong and other leaders arrived at Beiping's Xi Yuan Airport. After they reviewed the troops, they were welcomed by over 1,000 representatives and democratic activists from all walks of life. That night, the Central Committee took up residence in the fragrant hills outside the city. In Beiping, Mao Zedong reached out far and wide for advice on establishing the new China from patriotic democratic activists. On June the 15th, 1949, the first plenary session of the Preparatory Committee of the New Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference was held in Zhongnanhai's Qinzhong Hall. 134 representatives attended. In preparations for the new political consultative conference, Zhou Enlai was responsible for drafting its common program. His team went through at least eight drafts, from a general outline to the final version ready to be submitted for approval. On June 19th, when the first plenary session ended, Mao Zedong wrote a letter to Song Ching Ling, the widow of Sun Yat-sen, in which he invited her to come to Beiping from Shanghai to discuss state affairs. Soon, Deng Yingqiao arrived in Shanghai with two letters from Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai. To publicly clarify the CPC's proposals on the establishment of a new China after the first plenary session, Mao Zedong spent two days writing on the People's Democratic Dictatorship. He pointed out that to sum up our experience and concentrate it into one point, it is the People's Democratic Dictatorship under the leadership of the working class, through the Communist Party and based upon the alliance of workers and peasants. Mao's article was published on June the 30th. The next day, 30,000 people gathered in Beiping to celebrate the 28th anniversary of the CPC. It was the first time the party had ever publicly commemorated its anniversary with a mass celebration in the country's capital. As Mao Zedong said, the Communist Party of China is no longer a child or a lad in his teens, but has become an adult. Since the Chinese people were now the masters of new China, it should be they who shall create the new national symbols. A nationwide campaign was launched in July 1949, calling on the public to submit designs for a new national flag and emblem, as well as lyrics and music for the new national anthem. Many flag designs were received, but the submission of Zun Lian Sung, a common worker in Shanghai, was finally chosen. His design of five stars on a red background symbolizes the unity of the people under the leadership of the CPC. When Song Qingling arrived in Beiping on August 28, 1949, Mao Zedong, Zhu De, Zhou Enlai and other CPC leaders were waiting to greet her on the platform.
the CPPCC had its first plenary session on September the 21st, with 662 representatives from 46 organizations present. Many important decisions were adopted at Huayran Hall. The session also resolved to henceforth number years according to the Common Era Convention. The original Central Plain Time was renamed Beijing Time. On September the 29th, the meeting adopted the common program of the CPPCC, which clearly stipulated that the new China's state system was the People's Democratic Dictatorship, and its system of government was the People's Congress. Before the 1954 constitution, this common program served as a provisional constitution. The meeting unanimously elected Mao Zedong as the chairman of the Central People's Government, and Zhu De, Liu Xiaoqi, Song Qingling, Li Jiexian, Jiang Lan, and Gao Gang as vice chairman. On October the 1st, the Central People's Government Committee appointed Zhou Enlai as premier of the Government Administrative Council and Minister of Foreign Affairs. From this moment on, China had entered a new era. At 6 p.m. on September the 30th, all representatives of the session came to Tiananmen Square to participate in a foundation-laying ceremony for the Monument to the People's Heroes. Every life lost, every drop of blood shed, and every glorious deed will live forever in the history of the People's Republic of China. At 3 p.m. on October the 1st, the founding ceremony of the People's Republic of China was held in Tiananmen Square.
Commander-in-Chief Zhu De reviewed the People's Liberation Army, which consisted of the Navy, the Army and the Air Force. The Navy, which was reviewed for the first time, had only been established five months earlier. Most of the 155 soldiers attending the parade were former Kuomintang naval troops who had switched allegiance to join the cause of communism. It was a glorious moment that will never be forgotten in Chinese history. For the first time, the people of China had become the masters of their own country, society, and destiny. They stood up then, and they have been standing ever since. The establishment of New China was recognized and supported by the Soviet Union and the People's Democratic Republics of Eastern Europe, as well as some countries in Asia and Western Europe. Mao Zedong visited the Soviet Union in December 1949. The Chinese and Soviet governments formally signed the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship, Alliance and Mutual Assistance, together with complementary agreements on February the 14th, 1950. Although the People's Republic was off to a flying start, the party and the Chinese people were still facing severe tests at home. For starters, the conflict of the People's War of Liberation was not yet over.
On May 23, 1951, Tibet was peacefully liberated, marking the complete unification of the Chinese mainland. Local people's governments were quickly established. Following deployments by the central government, large-scale campaigns to suppress banditry were launched in newly liberated areas. By the first half of 1951, banditry on the mainland had basically been eliminated. Right after its establishment, the new China also launched campaigns to close brothels and rid the country of opium. In just a few years, prostitution was rooted out and opium, which had been the scourge of China for a century, was suppressed. In terms of the economy, the Kuomintang government had left behind a mess of severe economic recession. The task now was rebuilding in all sectors. Critics said that the CPC's military experience, although it had enabled the party to rise to power, was of less relevance to governing a country at peace. Some went so far as to question the CPC central government's ability to manage the economy. On June 10, 1949, just two weeks after the liberation of Shanghai, the Shanghai Military Control Commission seized the Shanghai Securities Exchange Building, which had been at the center of financial speculation. The suppression of illegal activities that had been sabotaging the financial system allowed the renminbi, the new Chinese currency, to enter the market smoothly. Long before then, in Xibaipo, the Central Committee of the CPC had formally adopted a resolution to establish a Central Finance and Economics Committee. In July 1949, the committee, headed by Chun Yun, was established. It immediately engaged in the task of stabilizing prices and centralizing management of the entire economy. Starting from October 15th, speculative capitalists hoarded a large number of supplies causing nationwide inflation. With allocation and deployment unified under the central government, large quantities of urgently needed grain, cotton yarn and coal were delivered to big cities from throughout the country. On November the 25th, the day when prices were rising fastest, the governments in major cities started to sell these goods on a large scale while tightening monetary policy and levying taxes, causing the bankruptcy of many speculators. By March 1950, the state formally promulgated measures on unified fiscal revenue, materials allocation and cash management, realizing the centralized management of the entire country's economy. When the PRC was founded, there were still more than 300 million people in newly liberated areas who had not yet enjoyed the benefit of land reform. In June 1950, the eighth meeting of the Central People's Government Committee discussed and passed the land reform law of the PRC. By the end of 1952, land reform had been completed in most of China. Over 46 million hectares were redistributed to 300 million peasants with little or no land. In the autumn of 1950, with the first anniversary of the founding of the PRC approaching, people from all across the nation arrived in the capital to attend the first National Day ceremony. On October 3rd, at a performance by art troops from ethnic groups who had traveled to Beijing, Mao Zedong invited the poet and political activist Liu Yatze to write a poem to celebrate the unity of all ethnic groups. Mao Zedong later penned his own verse in reply, in which he wrote, The night was long, and dawn came slow to the crimson land. 
For a century, demons and monsters whirled in a wild dance, and the 500 million people were disunited. Now, the cock has crowed, and all under heaven is bright. Here is music from all our peoples, from Yu Tian too. And the poet is inspired as never before.